this is part 32 of our 100% walkthrough for Oracle of Ages. And this part going through the third part of Mermaid's Cave, which is the sixth dungeon in the game. And we get the boss key. We get a ring actually outside the dungeon entrance to, I believe, the present. And then we return to the past. And since that's the uh, last note that I actually have down, I guess we just return to the past and yep. do basically nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we, other than the big key, we really don't do a ton in this. Um, this is the part where we kind of start bouncing. Boss key. It's actually the boss key in this or, game. Sorry, boss key. Uh -huh. It changes every other game. It, it really does. <laughs> It's probably, the, it's probably the big key in Oracle of Seasons. <laughs> <laughs> now, that would just be stupid, but it wouldn't shock me. <laughs> but yeah, outside of outside of the big, uh, sorry, boss key, we don't do a ton in this part. But right off the bat, like just navigating like those three or four enemies and then the Beemos as well, just to get to a treasure chest with only 10 rupees, I thought it was a little bit of overkill. <laughs> it's definitely a waste of time. And one thing I've actually kind of found surprising is we haven't used a mermaid suit yet, I don't believe in. Forget a dungeon item, you almost see your, uh, you use it almost exactly right off the bat in that same room. But we've yep. not used the, uh, I was eventually going to get there. Um, <laughs> but we have not used the mermaid suit, like, yeah, and I just think that's a very long time after getting the item to actually use the item in the dungeon. It really is. Like you said, normally they kind of throw you right into a scenario where you get it, but not so much in uh, once you get the mermaid suit. Now this room, you I couldn't remember what the case was, but we talked about this a little bit. Like, which lever do you actually have to pull to get the boss key to appear? And you said it, it's totally random yeah. every single time. It's like, it doesn't matter which side you do it. It actually doesn't matter, like, how many times you do it. Like, if you pull the left it does, and it doesn't work, that doesn't mean the right one's going to work. Like, you can actually go back and forth and do it multiple times. So, if you try each side and it doesn't work, don't worry about it. Like, you just really... Just pick a side and pull, and like eventually it'll happen. And I remember yeah. in practice, like man, there was one time I want to say I did almost ten times, you know, Jeez. just switching off sides before I even got the uh, the uh, boss key. And that's one thing, like when I was practicing, like I thought the game glitched. Oh like I did gosh. the left side, and I did the right <laughs> side, and I was like, is there something that I forgot early on in the game that like causes this to work? And I honestly thought I was about to restart recording Oracle of Ages, which oh, screw that. I would have never done because it is my least favorite Zelda game, as I've said <laughs> many different times. <laughs> exactly. It's just like at that point, if that would have happened, we said our 100% walkthrough just became like a 75% <laughs> yeah. We'll get you 100% to Dungeon 6, minus some uh, Goron dancing rings that we don't yeah. get, but oh well. <laughs> No, that would have been terrible if that would have been a glitch. But yeah, I couldn't remember if it was random or like you said. So it's it's just kind of funny, though, that we got the uh, the boss key, what, a minute, two minutes into this part? Yeah. I don't uh -huh. know what we do the rest of the time. Yeah, we actually don't get to the boss for, well, obviously it's in the last part, but it's a while. Yeah. I, you know, I want to say uh, maybe uh, maybe six, seven minutes before we even get to the boss. Now, it one is. thing, um, uh, with that last room with the boss, well, wasn't the last room, but the room with the boss key, that's also actually random in your uh, save file. I was kind of talking about this, and this might make it, it might not make a lot of sense to you, but sometimes, like within a certain save file, like like even though it's a random sequence, it'll all be the same within that yeah. save file. That's actually something that is different and random within the uh, same save file. So I mean, no matter what you do, it's never going to be the same. Which I think actually is kind of unique for a Zelda it game. Is. I'm actually kind of a fan of that as well. It's like, it's just something that no matter how much you like, and yes, I know it's just a matter of pulling the right. Yeah. Uh -huh. But like, it's still like, it's not something you can just like, you know, read a walkthrough and be like, oh, this is what I do. This is what yeah, I do. Uh -huh. Like you said, you could sat there and, and, and pulled the lever 10 times, whatever, and yeah. you've gotten it. And like you said, you thought your game glitched out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, one now, thing here's I... An, here's, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, that The door, the entrance door to the uh, present the part of the dungeon, like actually they're the same uh, decoration, but that little decoration... Yeah. <laughs> of the wave on the sides I really like. And then also having like a little like deep water right there and going down yeah. and get a ring outside the entrance, I also thought was very unique and cool. It really was. It's just, and we've talked before in previous games, not so much in this one, but like we really like when you, when we have to go outside in a dungeon, whether it's even just to like get to the next part or to grab an item or a heart uh -huh. piece or whatever. Like we enjoyed leaving the dungeon in the middle of the dungeon, like getting outside. It's like a breath of, a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Uh -huh. But in this dungeon, I feel like the only reason we do it is to transition from the past to the present. And we're just walking out the front door. It's not like there's like a little outdoor area inside the dungeon. It's like you just have to walk back out the front door. So even though we've loved that concept in the past, I feel like it kind of loses its appeal a little bit in this dungeon. Well, I think what you're getting at is the outside parts that we like are like inside of the dungeon, actually, if that exactly. makes sense. Like they're located within the like the location of the dungeon, whereas yeah. that outside area is actually outside of the dungeon. So yeah, it didn't have that same 
feel to it, but like, you know, kind of going back to you were comparing it to the spirit temple, like I believe yes. in the first part, like that's kind of the same thing with the spirit temple. Like you walk outside, you go back to the temple of time and then yeah. you come back as an adult. Like it kind of works in the same way. It does, but at least in the Spirit Temple, we also got to walk outside on the hands of the giant Colossus, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, now that was that was really cool right there. But now this underwater effect, I know in the last part I talked a little bit about that I didn't particularly care for the mermaid suit, uh -huh. but the underwater effect when we're still doing the top-down view, not the side-scrolling view, but the top-down yeah, right view, mm -hmm. like right here, yep. where the screen kind of has like a little ripple Love it. going to it. Like it makes it look like you're looking underwater, and I really like that effect, and I thought they used it pretty well here. You know these rooms are kind of a pain right there with the different water flows? I found those oh, to be yeah. very fun rooms. And kind of like what you were saying, like that ripple effect, I mean, yeah, for maybe a 3D game that's not really doing much, but for a 2D Zelda game, especially something that was on the Game Boy Color system, that yep. right there is like a big graphic, a big visual that can really make a Zelda or make a game stand out, period. And I think yeah. that's why Zelda games stand out so much, because like Nintendo does the little things like that that they might not necessarily do with other games. Agreed. I feel like if they also use it, again, it's a little thing, but they use it to kind of like push what the systems are capable of yeah, at the time. Uh -huh. and just, I know it seems like such a simple thing, but the effect, it really makes you feel like you're swimming around underwater. And, and honestly, I was just a big fan of that. It made the mermaid suit feel a little a little more special. Yeah, like I said, I know I ripped on it a little bit earlier, but I also like the use of like the colored tiles on the ground to let you know where you could surface and like back up to the, you know, whatever upper yeah. level you want to call it. Just, I thought they did a very good job of giving you visual indicators of where you could kind of get around, which I guess yeah. you kind of have to I do. I mean, yeah, yeah, I could kind of talk about underwater, but they did the same thing above water where you had kind of just like a regular blue and then yep. like a darker blue for the uh, deep water. Like that's something like we didn't have in Link's Awakening. And Link's Awakening, it's a great game. We both love it. One Absolutely. of our uh, top 10 Zelda games, go check out that video. But that's like video. that's one thing that this game had different that I really liked and Maybe just like, you know, even though Link's Awakening was great, maybe they could add like a little, like, you know, effect like that where yeah. you could go deeper underwater, but at the same time, they only had the flippers and not the mermaid suit. And that's exactly. why I was trying to tell you this item is so awesome because it allows <laughs> us to do things like that where you can't go under, well, I guess you could go underwater flippers, but you need a suit. When you go underwater, you need like a scuba <laughs> suit, man. <laughs> Although I got to say, Link looks a little weird with, with a mermaid tail. He does. <laughs> he does look a little weird. I agree with that. <laughs> now, here's something we talked about a little bit uh, before we got started. Like one thing that was annoying about switching back and forth between the past and the present was when you re-entered rooms that we'd already cleared out before or where we'd already solved the puzzles or mm -hmm. hit the switches, we had to kind of redo a little bit of that. And that previous room was a perfect example of it where we once again had to, you know, put use the cane to put the block down, scoot the pot over. It's like, we've done that before. We did it before early on in the dungeon, and but the fact that I think we've switched between the past and the present meant that we had to do it all over again, and, and that just, it, it kind of annoyed me a little bit. Now, this room right here annoys me because we kind of talked about the turnstiles <laughs> before in this dungeon, but that one right there, that turnstile is pointless because you basically yep. just walk through the same area twice, and that's the only direction you can really go. Now, I it know is. it kind of serves as backtracking a little bit, but that's about it, but anyways... This is going to wrap up part 33 of 100% Walkthrough for the Oracle of Ages. <laughs> 